All right, Arto. How are you, my Hi, friend? Hi, Gary. Yeah, doing doing fine. We'll pretend How? like we we'll pretend like what? we haven't been just talking for the last ten minutes. Hey. <laughs> yeah, huh? How are you? How are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> we haven't been talking on and off for the last six hours. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Welcome everyone. Thank you so much yeah. for uh, tuning in. We appreciate it tremendously. The dogs uh, appreciate it tremendously. If uh, like anyway, any time you have questions or comments, please post them below. And uh, let's get started. So uh, yeah. I just wanted to give a quick shout out to my friend Roberta in Wisconsin for sharing her thoughts this week. She is a, an amazing horse trainer with decades of experience, and um, I'll be with her in about two weeks in Wisconsin, and I really would love to get her uh, on an Instagram live because she is just uh, wicked smart and super appreciative of all animals. And uh, she is, to me, Artem, like the epitome of I know what I know and I don't know what I don't know. The problem is she knows more than she thinks she does, um, <laughs> which is always wonderful because you're like, wait, no, that makes total sense. So she had some little uh, bits of wisdom that I thought would be really great um, to share here. So Artem, I'm going to start off with Brandon Fouché's quote, you can't yeah. stop an emotional problem with a physical solution. What's that mean mm -hmm. to you? It's mean that a uh, problem exists in way different level from where we trying to solve it. Mm -hmm. Like in, in, in another universe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It'll so, so, and we, if you're talking about dogs, uh, that means that they actually not understanding what we're trying to communicate mm -hmm. because it's mental and we're trying to do that physical. Yeah. It's, it always reminds me of one of my favorite quotes, the ancestor to every action is a thought. So, yeah. you know, the dog is doing something physical because he's thinking something mental. And yeah. 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 So if you're always trying to take care of the physical, you're always one step behind. You're always on a reactionary basis. Um, and mostly not even here in the moment uh, uh, experiencing what's really happened. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about mental and physical confinement, the difference and the results of doing it, working with a dog through their mind and working through a dog, focusing on their body. And uh, it made me think of um, like a human example. I try to start with a human example of like a kid in a, um, like a shopping cart. You know, mm -hmm. you know that? And yeah, yeah. they see something on the shelf and they want to get to it and they can't. And then they start throwing a hype like, you know, a mom or dad is like, no, 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 we can't do that. And then they're stuck in the cart and they're like, ah, and they start yelling and they're having this emotional reaction because they're confined. They're not able to yeah. go explore the activity. So, um, I mean, it's something we can all relate to if we go into it. Do you guys have Target? What's Target? Target. Yeah, you don't have it. Okay. Um, it's like a big box store. They sell a lot of things. So Big shop? Is that a big shop? Yeah, like a Walmart. I don't know if you guys have those anyway. Anyway, um, so I'll just give you my definition, Artem, and then I'm going to jump in with you because I already have it written down, and then I'll let you freestyle. Mm -hmm. But the reason why it happens is, for me, the, re the repeated presentation of something and then yeah. the, the dog has a strong desire to investigate, which is a huge piece of what a dog is, is a curious creature. But because mm -hmm. they can't, for whatever mm -hmm. reason, which we'll talk about different types of these physical restraints, they can't get access to the stimuli. And then over mm -hmm. time, over time, over time, they just start to have outbursts. And it, you know it happens at homes and on leashes and things. And for me, the problem is us as the human have an expectation that these dogs understand what these barriers mean and yeah. are confused why they're having their outbursts. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add to that? I mean, is there something else you feel like why these dogs are having this, this problem when they're being physical, physically um, confined? Because they cannot communicate with what's happening there. Mm-hmm. And it can be a different type of communication. Sometimes even 
it can be a dog who wants to attack. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a whole different conversation. So yeah, they not able to they not able to do what they want, what they feel. That's why that outburst is happening. Yeah, it's actually uh, I guess that example with uh, with kid nice and also we can go to uh elder humans like waiting in a how to say it in english where a lot of people standing in a line and waiting in yeah. a line yeah it's so it's so personally for me <laughs> making me feel it's making me feel frustrated i want to get it <laughs> but i can't yeah and things like that I guess dry, a lot of drivers feeling that when, when they want to move, but it's a red light or things like that, or somebody like you driver in a, a hat can do something, and that's why driver behind is waiting and he's mm, like feeling that hurry up because he wants to be already there, but he's still here. So we're actually experiencing things like that also yeah. as humans. Yeah, and that's, um, for me, that's just always kind of funny is like we expect our dogs to be able to do these things that we're not even able to do. Yeah. You know, so a lot of humans can't control themselves in those moments when they want to interact or socialize with something. You know, they're waiting in line to get into a restaurant and they're just like, uh, you know, and whatever yeah, it is. Yeah. But, you know, Brandon has a good, um, a good little anecdote where he talks about, you know, dogs are like kids. Um, mm -hmm. They need to go interact with something have an experience and then they decide whether they want to do it again or not. So, oh, yeah. you know, so by the dog, and this is what we'll talk about later on, you know, with being able to have more freedom is able to have these experiences, which then let them calm themselves down, but then also let them know if they want to do that same thing in the future or not, Yeah, whatever it yeah. is. So one of the things you, I figured we would just expand on, you had just said, so the barriers We'll talk about those. And these are, the, you know, for me, the common ones. If you think of anything, please let me know. Like doors, walls, uh, in the car, windows, X-pens, which are, you know, those, um, those like little circle metal things that you know what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh, okay. uh, yeah. Or, and like baby gates. How do these mm -hmm. barriers are to... And uh, crates. Crates. Oh. Yeah. How did I not think of crates? Duh. Um, <laughs> how, do, how do these barriers disturb natural communication for the animals? It's still like the same, we just discussed it. Okay. So there's nothing they there, but they want to be <laughs> somewhere there. So they here and they want to be somewhere there and that barrier is stopping them from doing that, but they have strong emotion. Yeah. And what message do you think that's sending to the dog? between like our relationship. So if, you know, if I'm the one that's putting the barrier up, if I'm the one holding the leash, what relation, what relationship do you think is pieces? Many, many things. Yeah. I'm, I do not trust you. I cannot handle you. I cannot stop you. Uh, because of me, you have that, uh, tension, a lot of tension. I'm creating that many things. We just got some questions. I was just letting people know that we'll answer them towards the end because I don't want people to think that we're going to ignoring the questions. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, there's some type. It's, 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 it's again, miscommunication. Yeah. Yeah. It, it comes down to a dog expecting you to understand what they want and we, mm -hmm. we expect the, the dog to understand or the dog – expecting the dog for us to think like them and we're expecting to understand what we want. Well, we don't want you to go over there because you might get into trouble. You know, I don't want you to go over there because you, you might run out the front door and get hit by a car when the pizza is getting delivered. So it's that, that sticking point that we always kind of come back to where, you know, it's just a miscommunication in the relationship. Um, you know, is it, it's a definitely a one-sided communication, Correct. I mean, the dog, yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's from our perspective of what we think is happening. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I get it. Like, you know, if, if you're 
if your dog is having a problem, you know, jumping on people or, you know, is, is pulling on the leash and things like that. Some of these, some of these, um, solutions that we're talking about are fine for the moment until, you know, I get there until Artem gets there until a professional, another professional gets there. I mean, we have to keep the animal safe. We have to keep liability low, but we're, we're talking about the long term here about what, you know, what I see and what you see, um, in mm -hmm. shelters and rescues and all of these other problems that people are having um, in their homes. I, I listened to your advice. Ah, okay. beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Angelica. <laughs> yeah. So another common place we see these barriers that cause the animal stress is fences in the yard and when we're out walking dogs behind fences. So you yeah. have, do you have any experiences or input there? Oh, a lot, a lot of experience because we have a lot of uh, dogs living in a yard. Yeah. So what happens? And most of them waiting there in that other side for any activity on the street mm -hmm. to react. And they bark, scratch. Uh, lately, I even seen it's not the first time, but I only seen that sometimes uh, German Shepherd, which been like jumping, and I saw her, uh, half of her body in the air. So she been jumping and barking at us. We've yeah. been there with with clients and their dog. Yeah, and and for people that are a lot of emotions and a lot of energy, physical energy, which one they trying to um, how to say. Reduce off. Yeah, yeah, and it's all it's an, it's also addicting. I mean, all the chemicals that they're dumping oh, into yeah. their body with this constant like it's automa uh, automatic behavior. Yeah, yeah, they're fulfilling a need. I mean, that's the thing. It might not make sense to them, them but it's producing some type of joy um, in them. Not uh, you know, we don't understand it, but um, the other thing I notice a lot is well, like if I'm out walking. We'll talk a little bit about more more about leashes, but since I've been in Los Angeles and and traveling more, you know, when like you're saying, when you walk by with animals, the dogs that you're walking mm -hmm. learn to get responsive to the dogs behind the fence, because, yeah, because they're trapped. Can you can you mm -hmm. kind of explain a little bit more what happens there to the dog? How does the dog that you're walking feel when he's getting? A lot of energy thrown at him that doesn't feel depends, good. Depends. Depends on the dog. Yeah. Uh, some dogs feel danger, feel threatened. Yeah. And uh, but it's not regular. Mostly those dogs want to go to that fence mm -hmm. and to do the same stuff to that dog. Yeah. Like reactivity. Yeah. Yeah. And it very reactive reaction like Argh! Yeah. And and the interesting part is for the dog that's on the leash, it wouldn't be something normal for them because as soon as yeah. that as soon as that dog jumped out and did that, they would book it. And they learned to fight back. I actually had Yeah. What's happening? Do you hear me clear? I do, I do. Because it's showing low level. No, you're good. Of connection. Okay. Yeah. So what did you have happen recently? I actually had a consultation, I guess, one month ago. Uh, you actually saw that video, that black GSD puppy who been eating his tail all day long on Telegram. Do you remember? Yep. I sent that. Yep. So... Uh, we went to the walk and I, uh, I uh, how to say, uh, we had very short leash and uh, as soon that puppy saw another dog and it was also GSD, big male GSD, behind the fence, that puppy went after him like, whoa, 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 whoa. Mm -hmm. so then I turned back, connected uh, 50 feet. Yeah long leash and let that puppy go towards and in a few meters that puppy stopped and hear a body posture from like being oh, firm and like that changed to submissive ears on short tail like like that 
And second time, then ha they had that communication. They see each other. Fans was like uh, not solid fans. You understand what I'm trying to totally. say? Yep. They've been able to see each other, communicate even through the fans' touch, nose, and things like that. So then they finished that. Uh, we walked away, and when we been turning back, she came towards him with interest, and that's submissive posture already mm -hmm. from the very beginning. Like as soon she 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 felt not restricted, she started sinking. Yeah. Yeah, when she had choices, she felt more, yeah. she felt more freedom. Yeah. That's the part that's, you know, the leash takes away. Two, you know, two of the responses the animal has is either fight or flight. Mm -hmm. And if if it's on a short leash, the animal knows flight is not an option. So what's the other response, which is to to fight back? And then depending on what we do, the pulling, you know, the feelings that we're having, it can just exacerbate the problem. So yeah, I mean that's a, a, a great example of giving the dog the ability to make the choices and then see what um, see what that freedom produces. Yeah, because and know, she looked very serious about what she meant. Yeah. Know? Oh no, absolutely, absolutely, and she was because she had no other choice. She was cornered in, in her mind. And then immediate change, like boom. Yeah, you know, like uh, like you're saying, a lot of times the initial reaction is shock. You'll walk by, a dog comes charging out, and the dog you're walking is like, oh, man, wow, that's intense. But after yeah. time, after time, after time, a lot of times you'll see that dog stop doing that because now it's, they're like, wait a second, man. Like, I'm just passing through. Like, nothing's happening here. And then they start to then respond. So then you actually can create a problem that wasn't initially there uh, by, you know, having the shorter leashes and stuff. And we'll get to some of those, you know, how to solve that problem, which you just gave that and interesting thing about that situation, dog uh, behind the fence and dog on leash, both are restricted. Both are not in natural conditions. Mm -hmm. Both collecting, potentially collecting tension. Yeah. And becoming nervous. So, yeah. uh, for example, before Brendan, I I didn't think about it at all. Yeah. Only I, I only... Uh, uh, had understanding about leash reactivity, but fences and all of that stuff, I never thought about it like that. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, right now, like the situation itself creating problem. Yeah, I'm seeing and understanding that. And from having that, it's because we can deal with our dog, but we can't deal with the dog behind the fence, so we should understand how to properly, uh, how to say, uh, create experience for our dogs when they see things like that. Yeah, we have to respect the experience. Like one of the brand thing Brandon talks about is walking is very unnatural because you're walking yeah. through other animals' territory. So we're walk to us, we're walking down the street, but, but to a dog, you're walking through my territory. So you, yeah. it, and that's not something you would just do. You don't go in the jungle and see animals start walking through each other's territory, right? There's, there's yeah, a lot yeah. of respect of the boundaries that happen. So we're already kind of moving on to leashes. Like, so we're mm -hmm. talking about how it is a man-made device. that's very unnatural. I mean, like you can, the, to, the way to me you can see, and you, you had brought this up and I thought it was a great analogy, um, was just watching a puppy go on a leash for the first time. Yeah. And you could see how unnatural it is, right? Yeah, they shocked. Mm -hmm. The you you asking me a question right? Yeah. Now? Oh yeah. Or what? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Usually they shocked. They do not understand uh, why they have that limitation. Why they feel that physical tension here. I'm not talking about pain or things like that. Just tension, which is also not natural. Yeah. And. Uh, Yeah, regularly we need to spend some time to show what that rope <laughs> should mean for him. Yeah, and, and still it will never like be on leash, uh, no matter how we uh, teach him to understand that leash. It still will be till the end of the days unnatural for them. Yeah. Yeah, and. Um... 
one of the things I, I, I really enjoyed in Yassan's book was mm -hmm. a, a, how he discovered it was what happened neurologically to the younger animals that weren't able to experience yeah. consistently the ability to go interact with things and, it, and you know what they were feeling and how that affected them later in life, right? With impulse control, is yeah. that is that was yeah, yeah yeah. Can you add anything to that, or is that bit, what 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 what? It's the, hard for me to explain in English. Okay, yeah, <laughs> no, I, I get you. So basically, what Yasan had had witnessed was that the wolf cubs, as was it in captivity, or that he discovered this, or was it in the wild? He. Uh... I guess in captivity. That's what I was yeah, thinking. Because, yeah, because, yeah, yeah, captivity. Yeah, the animals that were not able to explore and have that freedom actually had bigger problems later in impulse yeah. control because their brains weren't able, weren't completely wired because they were still like, hey, what's that? Hey, what's that? What's that? What's that? Mm -hmm. Versus being able mm -hmm. to go over there, have an interaction, go over, have an mm -hmm. interaction. So their impulsiveness naturally declined because of their ability to, to explore. So we, mm -hmm. we have to really understand as, you know, as puppies that that's very important to their brain development is to go out and have these experiences and it can really affect them later on in life. Um, I think, you know, one of the other things I see very commonly where people are creating um, a problem is when they're grabbing their dogs and, and holding them back from things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, have you had anything recently happen? Like, you know, people are trying to keep their dogs, you know, from running out the door um, I mean, is there anything in particular that you'd want to add on to that? I mean, I, I, I mean, I think we're all pretty, um, we've seen that a lot. Um, people physically. Yeah. Hold. Yeah. Um, I had, um, that guest for boarding that how to say Aboriginal breed. Mm, oh, I forgot. Was it the, Oh, no, 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 I don't know. Basenji. Basenji. I thought that's what it was. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they tried to, because he'd been pulling on leash and uh, go, like trying to go everywhere, they tried to hold him heel, heel, heel by using short leash. And so he had that experience for one month. And after that, he came to me and I saw a very tense animal. Like he been uh, like like when he wants to sleep something he uh, pulled so hard like lie on the ground things like that you know mm -hmm. like let me sniff it yeah <laughs> let me get to this so he like leash for him uh, represented um, how to say not fight but uh, conflict. Conflict and uh, constant uh, fighting on each other through that leash. Yeah. Competition? Not competition. Okay. <laughs> Things like that. Yeah. yeah. No, I got you. And after they gave him freedom, we saw a different dog, I guess, in four days. Yeah. Yeah. The impulsiveness goes down when they're able to go do the things they want to do. We'll, we'll talk more about that. That's kind of yeah. what we're going to yeah. do. Um, this one I'm kind of hitting you with. I don't know if you saw this one in the document, but for me, one of the things I learned a lot about the physical versus mental confinement is o obedience training itself. Yeah. It, to me, it's always putting a dog in a physical position, thinking that yes. it's going to change the way they feel mentally. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, is dog training itself a problem? No. But you, you're not gonna. It's not gonna work to change the way a dog feels. Um, Again, Brandon have good saying about it. You can't, you cannot have problems with dog training, but you can have problems because of dog training. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So no problem with dog training, but behavioral problems because of dog training. Because it, it comes back to every animal has a reason why they do things and if we are saying sit down and they're not yeah. feeling sit down just and like they want to go to sniff other dog then we're trying them yeah, yeah and then we're just going to have the problem and if i woke up first thing in the morning and you're telling me to lay back down again it's going to cause me a problem it's not what i feel right now 
Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that's a struggle for a lot of people because that's what we do. It's what we're sold to control the animal. But we have to look at it. I mean, if you're using behavior to solve behavior, do some Googling. It does not work. It does not work in human psychology. There's a lot of research out there. Um, you can't use behavior to solve a behavior. You have to use relationship. And that's what we're talking about here is giving the dogs the ability to make the choices. And are they always going to make the right choices? No, but that's what we're here for. It's not to just let them take them off leash and let them run around free and be craziness, mm. right? That's not the, no way. I mean, that's the extreme. I think a lot of people go to when we, when yeah. I when I talk to them about what am I supposed to do? Just no, like that's that's this like whoa extreme. That's already where you're at. Like we can get somewhere in the middle, you know. We like you did. You didn't just let the dog off leash. You put him on a fifty foot leash, and you know. And that's one of the things. Um, when I was talking to my friend uh, Roberta, the horse trainer, she said tools are made for support when the when the animal gets in trouble, mm -hmm. right? It, it's it's a way to communicate to build a relationship. When you use it, you should be already thinking about how to get rid of it. So as soon mm -hmm. as you put the fifty foot leash on, you are using it to support the dog in case she made a poor choice. But it's also giving her the ability to make choices, so that in the future you can take it off. It was, it was, you were using it knowing that this is part of the way we're going to get rid of it, not a way to always have it on. Uh, Actually, I'm in the process, in that process with my second dog that we uh, get recently, like four months ago. Yeah. So she's one and one year and a half husky. Mm -hmm. And she mostly when she's off leash, she's dragging a uh, rope in the park. So we in the middle yeah. to get rid of that too. Yeah, no, for sure. And before she she was wild unleashed. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. we go into that direction. Yeah, it's a process. Yeah. It's not like no, no, just let him go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and and um, it, it, I'm gonna hopefully I can find it. But it, it's funny. This is this is one of the things Roberta had said to me, and I thought that was. Um, she said to me was, let me just see if I can see this here. Yeah. She said, uh, it goes into what you're saying right now. During our, something she said during our talk was, it's for her, it's, it, she understands that not everybody wants to get to that next level. Like in her horse mm -hmm. training, she understands not yeah, all of her clients want to be like yeah. her. And that's fine. But she said that that's one of the fun things for her. And you will never, ever, ever get bored if you're always trying to be better, right? If you're, if you're trying to understand your dog better, you're never going to have boredom. And for some of us, that's the fun part is trying to really figure these problems out. And, you know, our, our version of getting to that destination is different. You know, some people, you get their dog to walk on the leash a little bit and they're fine. They're like, okay, that's all I wanted. Perfect. You know, everything's great. But you could have more. And like Way that's, more. that's us, you know, but, and then, but for them, that's that, you know, that's, that's good. And if the dog's, you know, at a place that's happy, then, uh, you know, that's, that's the happy medium. So a quick thing, Artem, and I, and I, um, a question for you, do you ever see dogs and I'm going to show a video right now. I don't know if you knew that, but I'll show a dog. Have you ever seen dogs once you take the restraints away act differently? So you remove the fence, you remove the leash. Yes. And then yes, they, yes. can you, is there any stories that you have? I mean, I know you just talked about the, I have here. Beagle that coming from boarding from time to time. Like as soon as I, uh, <laughs> letting her be inside of her crate, she's starting barking at dogs with which one she just came into the house. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> as soon as, as I open crate door, I'm seeing uh, submissive behavior and she not barking at all. Yeah. I'm going to show that video. I don't think you'll be able to see it unless you have Facebook. I, I have second phone. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to show this video here, which is a very uh, famous video that goes around, which is these two dogs. And here's the exact situation we're talking about. All to the right. To the right, there is no fence.
And then here's the other one I, that a lot of people have seen too. It's these two dogs wanting to fight. Or a bunch of dogs. So, so much intensity with a barrier. Yeah. And then you move the, remove the barrier and the problem disappears. And that's what we're talking about. Like for, for me, it's about really understanding is this... Oh, let me take that off. Hold on. Is this... Is this a, you know, it's part of what we're trying to figure out when we bring dogs in. Is this a barrier problem or is this really a dog problem? Is the dog really feeling this or is this is as simple as if you just remove the leash, remove the barrier, the problem goes away? And you've seen this happen multiple times. I have too. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's amazing when you give the dogs the ability to make the freedom. To give, to, like, like Roberta said, all animals can make choices. And one of the things I think we're going to talk about later on that you had mentioned about giving dogs off leash freedom is we have to understand that they might make another choice. We have to trust that they might make another choice. And that's scary for us because we've seen it a lot. So we have to, we have to know that there is the possibility if we understand what the restraint is, what the mental problem is, the barrier, the leash, the gate, the physical restraint, that if we remove that, the dog is now capable of making another choice. Mm -hmm. Anything else that you have? Yeah, and I was saying that uh, it's a good example of how environment itself can uh, influence, influence behavior of the dog. They just there with <laughs> having that fence and because they met there this happening. Mm -hmm. For example, do that if those dogs uh, able to meet somewhere where there is no uh, such a thing as fans, probably we will see avoidance or communication without barking. Yeah. Yeah. Then so environment itself also important, and we should understand how they uh, see, feel that environment. And it's way, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's so different from how we see that. Yeah. We talked about it in the beginning. Yeah. And then also it goes back to our, I don't remember exactly what episode it was, around three, four, five, where we talked mm -hmm. about personal space. When there's no barrier, now the dog has the ability to look and assess the environment for that dog and say, how, do you, how are you making me feel right now? Do you make me feel like I want to approach? Or mm -hmm. are you making me feel like I want to stay away? Yeah. And, and we have that all the time, you know, it, um, ourselves. When you see people, certain people make you want to like, you know, the way, just the way they look, it makes them more approachable or not approachable, you know? Yeah. Do they, yeah, do yeah, they, look, yeah. Do they look grumpy? Do they look, uh, you know, inviting? So we're able to go through those social cues by assessing the environment and, um, so let's, let's go into it now, Artem, where you were talking about, you know, the mental connection. So we talked about some of the problems that a lot of people get into when they're using a physical restraint to try to solve a problem. Um, mm -hmm. my friend Roberta said if with the horses, um, there's a famous horse trainer that she was uh, friends with who passed away a little while ago. And he always used to say, Tom Dorrance was his name. You have to have their feet in your hands. Right, So you have to be able to control your horse's feet by your hands. So there's a relationship that's happening there. And you had said the same thing, which is, how can I expect my dog to follow me on leash when it doesn't follow me off leash? Mm -hmm. Is there anything you wanted to, you want to go into something there? It's, it's a quick test. Everybody can test it go somewhere in a fence area and try to and drop the leash yeah and if and if you have problems on leash you will see why yeah 
because your dog will be not interested in you. That dog probably uh, will be not in a following mode and attention of the dog will be on environment. That's why he is pulling on leash or acting reactive towards dogs, people, because he's all in, in that environment and mentally he's not with you, but physically connected to you by the leash. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if we don't have uh, those relationships, actually I'm calling that like, it should be like between dogs. You will never see pack of the homeless dogs and the alpha dog having leashes. He's just standing, going, and other dogs following because of relationships that they have with that dog, because of who he is and how they feel around him. Yeah. And a lot of that things also yeah goes to personal space episodes. Yeah. Who you are for your dog. Yeah. Brandon always says the alpha dog makes everybody feel a certain way at a certain time for a certain reason. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, all, that. it's all emotional. It's not physical. It only, becomes, yeah. it only becomes physical if I have to discipline when I disagree. But until then, yeah. it's what I'm doing that makes you want to follow. It's how I make and, you and feel. Not, and that physical uh, disagreements, uh, the goal of that is still mental. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so it's all about mental connection. Yeah, I did a, a, a little experiment. So I'm here in Miami at a friend's house and they have um, iguanas, you know, iguanas, like the big lizards. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and there's a bunch that hang in this one tree. And um, it's been interesting, the sound, how it creates a curiosity. And for me, this is the way I've been working on it with my dogs is because they are like, wait, what's going on over there, right? They're, they're curious. Now, mm -hmm. the, the curiosity is, is, um, is fine, right? When their body language is a certain way, but then yes. when, it, when it becomes more intense, then that's where the discipline comes in. Yeah, that's more predatory, yeah. Yep, and that's where I have to make them feel a certain way at a certain time for a certain reason. And that is that they're able to be free, but there's still consequences. And that's, that's what nature is. You know, like uh, if, you know, uh, Brandon always says, if you go to the jungle, you're going to see. Yeah, all you will know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're going to see all kinds of different animals interacting. Why do they stay away from each other? Why does the zebra know to stay away from the lion? Why does the lion know to stay away? You know, why does everybody know what to stay away from each other? And that's because of consequences. That's not because of leashes or recalls or food or e-collars or tug rewards or nothing. Training approach. Nothing training, right? There's no down stay because you're going to go run into a lion's mouth. It's you get chased by the lion. And if you get away, then you realize like, oh, shit, that's important, right? And it doesn't have hmm. to happen a lot. It just happens enough uh, that you learn the lesson. Um, and then you also start to learn, you know, like there was some video I was watching. My friend gave me a login for YouTube TV and there's a Yosemite channel. And they were talking about how certain animals will, that normally are prey predator, will share certain space because they realized at that time it's not hunting time. So yeah. the, like the zebra might be closer to the tide. water, yeah. Yeah, right, because they realize this isn't a hunting time. But mm -hmm. later on they realize, oh, something feels different. So then they act different. So it's these consequences that – the natural consequences that happen that make the animals feel differently. And um, so – And making them seem uh, – and making them think next time, like yeah. what potentially can happen. Yeah. Experience. Yep. Yeah. So one of the things you're, you – and, and I believe too, I'm just, I'm not blaming you. I'm just saying, you know, you, um, you talked about is having off leash time and yeah. it's a huge fear for most people. Do you have for a lot of people? Yeah. Do you have a, for a lot of people? And that to me is always a great indication of, um, how do I say this? I'm going to try to say this politically correct. It's a good indication of where your relationship is. Because yeah. a lot of people think they have a great relationship with their animal and then they're scared to drop the leash. Well, then what kind of relationship yeah. do you have? Like, do they follow you? What is it? Like, why, why is that now a big fear 
when you think you have this connection, I love my animal, but then when you try to give them freedom, there's a Which big they thing. need. Yeah. I mean, I'm on the road for six, week, six weeks with my, without my wife. I have a lot of freedom, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? right? Like, you know, but, but there's... And she still loves you. <laughs> she does. She does. And she's in Los Angeles, right? There's, so there's a lot of other things that go into the relationship that make that fine, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so is there anything that you can, and I'll add some stuff too, but I'd like to get your opinion of what, what can people there. do to start that process? You know, you had mentioned going into a, a, a confined space and dropping the leash and seeing what happens. Is there anything else, like if you have a client, what you tell them to start that process of giving their dog more freedom? First of all, stop doing things, which we discussed yeah. in previous episodes. No, ab- absolutely. Like, that is a uh, huge prerequisite yeah. Of, yeah, of, yeah, yeah. of moving forward is stopping what you're – that can what can cause these problems great like yeah if you want your dog be around you off leash so why are you teaching him go forward towards something that stimulates him yep mm-hmm. so things like that and if you if you hearing that for the first time you can not talking to you but to somebody who watching us you can go to previous episodes here on facebook or on uh youtube on gary's channel mm-hmm. so yeah stop doing things um changing uh relationship at home because where we communicating with dogs or fleas also where, where we can influence them by ourselves not with that instruments called leash at home yeah so we, and if we not able to uh make them feel a certain way or fleas at home uh, I guess then when we will go somewhere outside and letting them be off leash, it's, a, it's already a problem. So we should do a homework. We should stop doing things which cause problems, which teaching dog to move forward towards something that making them feel stimulated. And uh, technical aspects are like it should be fenced area. So if you will need to chase your dog to stop him physically, and it can happen also. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, the area should be like that with the fence. Second, uh, I always uh, letting dogs be uh, off leash after I seeing that they mentally here on leash. Like I'm just walking, it can be uh, back and forth in, an, in, in that area, in that fence area. And I'm seeing that dog around me, but most part of the leash on the ground and that dog not going somewhere else. He's holding himself with me. And then I'm just dropping leash, not clicking it. Off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just, dro- oh, yeah. Just, just dropping leash and not saying, okay, you can go or things like that. Saying nothing, just going. Yeah, that's a huge piece. A lot of people do that. As soon as uh, their, dog, washing, their dog are so, is so used to when you unclip the leash or drop it, just bolting away from you. Yeah. Yeah, that's a huge piece. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not making a big deal of uh, letting them be off leash. Mm-hmm. And they drag in that leash, and that leash should be long. I, I prefer in the first stages that leash to be like 15 feet or foot feet yeah yeah oh yeah feet yeah the longer feet. the better i mean there's nothing wrong 50 feet yeah. 20 feet you know 20 yeah. 20 meters go for it i mean it's of course of course uh, it, it will be way better that if it will be no dogs yep less destructed area yep just Sounds simple for the initial experience of what will happen i had a friend yeah. a friend that said that to me recently was you know kind of nervous about what would happen and i'm like well there's nothing you can do until you you know we can think about yeah, yeah, what, you're what, still, what yeah yeah you have to do it you have to say okay oh shit yeah, yeah. yeah. what 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 will happen when i first try to drive a car i don't know you got to do it nobody <laughs> knows yeah maybe i i need to spend like 10 10 months to learn it or maybe like a few weeks yeah, yeah? Well, and that's one of the things Brandon always talks about is, you know, think about what all your biggest fears are. Use all the things that you can to solve those fears, and then you have nothing to fear. 
So if you're worried about your dog running away, put a leash on. If you're worried about your dog biting people, put a muzzle on. If you're worried about if you're, all of those things, just keep thinking, okay, how can I use these fears to make me more powerful? What am mm -hmm. I, how, how am I going to be able to get where I want to go? Yeah, nice, nice, right? nice. Because the fears aren't mm -hmm. bad. They're only bad if it stops you from doing it because they can actually yeah. be powerful thinking like, okay, I'm not worried about this. I'm not worried about that. Um, so, and, and then what are the benefits, Artem? Like, you know, you had written a couple things here that I thought were really great. You know, you let the dog, you give the dog a chance to be themselves, right? You yeah, get to actually absolutely. see, I mean, what other benefits do you see from giving your dog more, more time to, to show you who they are? <clears throat> if it done properly, uh, I regularly see dogs, uh, settle down because they able to pee on that tree, sniff that piece of the ground, uh, go few meters uh, ahead because no leash holding them back immediately. Yeah. Uh, and they feel like they can fulfill their uh, needs, emotional, psychological. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think and big, big, big piece of doing this is of course to know how to stop that dog if something will happen. Like if it is aggression, put muzzle on. If that dog is not uh, didn't have muzzle before, just work that before you let that dog be off leash. So then he will be not doing that on the ground. 30 minutes <laughs> yeah. while you're there. Yeah. So prepare and uh, be ready to chase that dog and stop him. <laughs> That's why we have that dragon leash. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what I find too. The dog starts to balance himself out because, yeah. because he now feels like he's in control. Even though he's not in control, he is in control. Like that's the... No, that's, fulfill, it's, not, it's not about control. Exactly. It's about fulfilling what you... Uh, Feel yeah. desires that you have right now in a moment. Yeah. I also doing that, by the way, uh, on leash. Mm -hmm. I'm walking and not letting me pull. Yeah. That's all. Changing directions if needed. Yeah. So dogs can sniff, communicate uh, around me. Those 15 feet, foots again, feet, feet or foots. I'm uh, feet. Uh, feet. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is what I said in the beginning. So we can start walking that place on that leash. The only thing is not, do not pull me. And we can just go to some direction. If dog trying to pull here, we can go there, there, or there. Yeah. So, and when we change in direction, that dog uh, should follow us because leash will make that dog to follow us. But we're not holding them. Uh, them uh, in heel, we just wanting them to follow and making them to follow. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a it's a sense of freedom, you know. Yeah. When they off leash, it's a sense of freedom which calms them them down. Again, if if it's done properly, if all things that should be before. Uh, if they are done. Yeah. I think, um, so I just wanted a couple, a couple little things here and just to, to in the kind of in the closing. Um, I go to a lot of shelters and rescues. And one of the things mm -hmm. I think um, people can get confused on is watching dogs fence fight mm -hmm. and thinking that's exercise. Hmm. Right, so the dogs are running and barking and chasing at each other through the fence. No, yeah. nothing good is happening. Yeah, exactly. So we have to be aware of what, what that's creating in the dog emotionally. Because, I mean, especially for me, like somebody that lives in, a, in um, places where yards are very close. I don't, you know, I know in some places it's, you know, a lot of places it's like that. Mm -hmm. We have to be careful because if your neighbor has a dog and you have a dog, now we have a problem. So if we're letting the dogs do that in the shelters and thinking that's exercise, what are we going to do when the dog gets home and he's doing that and now the neighbor's dog is doing that and we have a huge problem? And, um, you know, for people that are suffering from that, 
You know, if your dog is fence fighting with the neighbor's dog or you're having problems with that, for me, the best thing you can have them do is meet. And you might not be qualified to do that. That's fine. Call a professional. I mean, that's what, that's what people are out there for. You don't, you know, you don't know enough to do your taxes. You know, most people, uh-huh. for some reason, think they know enough about dogs. But this is a great opportunity to get a professional involved to say, okay, yeah. my neighbor has a dog. I have a dog. They fence fight. How can we get this to stop? And the uh-huh. easiest way is, for, to, like, as we've seen in these videos, is to get rid of the fence and let the uh-huh. dogs actually interact. And then you don't have the problem anymore. Because they understand who each other, like they understand each other. Um, it's yeah. just like at your daycare when, you know, when you're letting dogs out of the yard and there's a dog on one side of the fence and then a dog on the other side of the fence, they don't fight. They know each other. It's the problem solved. But when, when we, when it's that barrier creates all that tension and it can be, you know, a huge problem. So, uh, if you're in the shelters, rescues, daycares, like, you know, that stuff really is, um, can be creating problems. So. Don't let that happen. Don't let that happen. Um, looking at that. Do you think, you know, like when I was explaining about when I travel and getting my dogs imprinted on that, do you think that'd be beneficial to talk about right now? Yeah, of course. Mental part of The mental part of it. Yeah, because we can, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, we should talk about it. Oh. Like the whole, whole idea, if you want to, let me start, yeah, and you then you will share your experience. Uh if we want, if we want dogs to be away from something, it should be done not physically. And Gary will explain how he's doing that. Yeah. So, like so one, of, one of the things Dane, uh, uh, Brandon talks a lot about is the stay that nature teaches. So the true stay in nature has a danger component. Yeah. We stay away from things we app- are apprehensive of. So. Yeah, there's something danger that makes the dog feel so they're standing on there's something and an apple falls they jump back there was a danger component so they stay mm-hmm. away so I travel a lot I have a, an RV um, and the most important thing for me when I get somewhere new is to look at the environment and figure out what's the expectation for my dog so one of the things Brandon always talks about my dogs have to know where to eat where to sleep and where to go to the bathroom that's the three most important pieces Once they're moving through that space, doing those things off leash with the expectation of going to that next place, then I can start to do more and more and more. So for example, as soon as I got to my friend's house in Miami, the first place we did was we went into the backyard because they're learning that's where I go to the bathroom. They go into the environment, they're smelling, they're smelling everything. This is what the expectation is. Then we're learning, you know, where is our resting place? So I take them right from the yard, I open the door, and we go. Go into the bedroom. We go. Now, this is the part that's kind of interesting for me is I don't shut the door. I leave the door open, and I wait for them to make a mistake. Because I want them, the only way I can teach them is if they do something wrong. Until then, I can put them in there and shut the door, but it doesn't mean that they actually know that they're supposed to stay in there. They're just forced to stay in there. So... They'll come in, they'll hear noises, they look around, they'll stand on the edge, they're testing the boundary. Where am I supposed to be? And by me creating a danger component, they learn to stay in there. They learn that that's the best place for them to be. Because me as the leader, my job is to assess danger and then show them what they're supposed to do. So I, I at first create this, they go in there, then they'll want to stay in there. Then later, if we're going to dinner, if we're doing something, I will shut the door. But they're not physically, they don't feel physically confined because they already knew it was a place that they should be anyway. So then I don't get the barking, the scratching, the whining, the wanting to follow because they have already understood that that's where they should be. It's the best place for them. So if I'm out and I'm having, you know, we're in the kitchen having coffee or whatever, my dogs don't feel like they have to be out there because if they were supposed to be out there, they would. And then I slowly, slowly start to increase. So right now they're in with my friend who's taking a nap on her couch with her dog all loose in the living room. But if I start to walk to that back bedroom, they're imprinted to follow. They understand if I go out this side gate and we go down to the lake, they go right to the lake. They're understanding what the expectation of where to follow. They don't get sidetracked and wander. They understand where where the safety is and that's around me that's my goal and by doing that they get more and more freedom and um 
it works for me because I travel a lot and I stay at a lot of friends' homes. Um, some of them are dog friendly. Some of them aren't. I have a sliding door on my RV and I go places and I leave that open. I, I you know, so because I can't always, you know, I, it's nice, you know, it's a nice breeze or whatever. And I can't have my dog having that feel as if that's a barrier. So when a dog walks by, they want to go after them. There's a lot of times where I open that door and they meet dogs. So they don't have an expectation of confinement or, or, a, or a problem with the door because the door doesn't represent you're never going to. There's, it's, yeah. You know, it's funny. There's a, an interesting video Brandon has where he's using downstay for a dog because the anticipation of most people, Artem, you know, when you put a dog in a downstay, it means you're not going to interact. Right. So what he did was the opposite. He put the dog in a downstay and then let a bunch of dogs out. And then the dog didn't know what to do. And what did he do? He got up and he interacted. So he was reversing what the dog had already had an anticipation for. And that's my goal. I know I do that a lot with barrier frustration. If the dogs are having problems with the fence, I bring the things in and they're like, oh, wait, this fence doesn't make me not be able to socialize. It actually is. It's OK. The things come in. Um, yeah. Regularly, all of those restrictions represent only one thing only one physical and emotional experience unfulfilled tense not able to communicate yeah so no choice in general yeah no absolutely no choices um so i'm gonna i'm gonna just uh, bang through these questions real quick and then we'll end with yeah. artem's final thoughts so uh somebody had posted about how to get my dog to stop chewing up my socks and, uh, so I have already answered. So you need to figure out why he's uh, feeling okay to choose something that belongs to you. Yeah. And have your smell on it. Yeah. What things you're doing to make that dog feel like that. Yeah. My socks uh, lying on the floor all day long. Yeah. Nobody chewing it. And, and I think this is where we get into this confusion. And I don't know this person, but, I'll, uh -huh. um, but I'm just saying, you know, this is where like a – from my experience, and this might not be true, this is just, you know, one piece of it. When mm -hmm. we give a dog a toy and then we expect them to not understand what the, what the sock is, not a toy. Like, you know, so the dog's allowed yeah. to chew on their Kong or chew on their stuffed animal. Yeah, but, and, and, so, and socks and toy, both made from uh, textile, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Like material, I mean. Yeah, and then a lot of times we understand it creates, and we don't understand that it creates a competition. The dog grabs it and then we start to go after them. Yes. So it's the same way my dog grabs a stick and gets other dogs to chase her. She yeah. grabs a thing and then starts the competition. How fast are you? You know, what's going to happen? Kind of fun. Do you have this move? Can you juke down like I can? Um, so it can create a competition. So I'm also looking at is there things in the relationship that I'm teaching my dog to compete with me for? Because it, yeah. it, it really is a simple solution. It's the same way that I'm, you know, if the dog is, again, do, if you're doing all of those other things that we've talked about in our nine, nine other episodes, then eight, eight episodes, this is nine. Yeah, yeah, this is nine. Then it's, then there is definitely time to do something, right? There is absolutely time to do. But before then, we have to have everything else. We have to have our helmet on before we ride the bike. We have to have the right shoes on. We have to, we have, to have a lot of pieces in, in place. Because if not, then we're just putting pressure on a dog for something that we created. And I'm not into that. And I know you're not into that. Yeah, so we have, absolutely. we have to look back and say, why would my dog think that that's something that's okay? And it's harmless. And I'm not saying that you should be judged for it. And I'm not saying that you didn't love your dog and have best intentions. Most of the time, that's the problem. You know, we do these things because we love our dog. I did it. You did it, right? I mean, Artem shared the stories about the things he did with Camilla, and I did the, you know, shared those stories. So go back and look at those, and I think you might have some light bulb moments. Um, and if you don't, if everything you're saying was like, no, I don't do any of those, and my dog still wants to grab your socks, well, then we can, we can you know, once we have a better understanding of your dog, there's things that we easily can, can do to, um, to create discipline in those situations where the dog will not be interested in going back, right? Because they'll understand that that's not something for them to go to. Anything else there? No? Again, like, if the question is what to do, yeah? Like, how I stop this, yeah? Tell, tell your dog that you don't like that. But if you're telling your dog 
that you don't like that. And he do and do and do it again and again. Something uh, happening not about to do part. Yeah. Something happening before between relation in your relationships between you and your dog. Yeah. Um, you're saying in the fight or flight when you're trapped in a barrier. Um, yeah. Um, so somebody had a question. Shoba, make sure you check your email because um, we have to we have to set up our time to Skype. I know we got the time difference um, between Mallorca, Spain, and me. So just pick a day next week and we will talk. She, she uh, Shoba, she's I, I shared one of her emails with you, Artem. She is doing amazing work with some rescues in Spain. Really, really trying to implement. Um, and doing the best job she can with the information she has at the time. So I'm very, very excited to talk to her more. And if there's anything I can do to help uh, people like her, I mean, oh, she's really, really doing it. Um, somebody had uh, asked about the leash. You know, yeah. So, um, so what about safety? As you don't necessarily want your dog to greet many of the dogs who walk by on a walk who are not friendly. And um, I think... You know, so I think that, do you understand that question, Artem? Like you want to walk yeah. your dog and not interact? Yeah. Okay, yeah. You, 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 have, you say something and then I'll, I always feel like I answer first. You, you answer. Of course, not all dogs should be able to, we, how to say it in English? We, of course, we will not meet with every dog that we uh, meet on the walks. As for us, we're not uh, communicating with each and each person that we see on the street, especially if that person behave uh, weird, strange, yeah. or dangerous. We go in opposite directions mm -hmm. also. Yeah. So depends on uh, on the dog, and and again, this is where our job uh, is to understand so with which one dog we can communicate we, we can let our dog to communicate in which situations what should happen like making them be off leash somewhere yeah for the first time they meet and then we will next maybe next time they will be able to meet on leash and walk together on leash because area is not uh good for letting dogs be off leash so we should understand like if you my advice is that if you feel uncomfortable by seeing that dog, which is coming towards, you should not go there. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of questions uh, to owner of that dog, dog you should ask to also. I'm always asking, how your dog with other dogs? I'm not asking, is he female or male? I'm just asking directly, how your dog with other dogs? Mm -hmm. You know, depends whom you have, owners uh, regularly uh, start asking back, girl or boy. So then I see that person not sure on his dog, and it's already signal. Yeah, things like that. We we need to understand uh, what kind of dog we have in front of us. Yeah. If we're not able to understand, is that a good partner for our dog in that stage that we are now? So then I guess we should not letting them communicate and just go, move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Don't stop, just move. Yeah. And I, and I think for me, it's, it's okay not to meet every dog if you're giving your dog what they need. So if your yes. dog, right, if your dog goes to Artem's daycare and is with dogs five days a week, and you're walking down the street, then he's not missing anything. Yeah, that's and having and, and having a few friends in a in a block. Yeah, where that's just person the, lives. It's just the dog. Like, who gives a shit? It's another dog. I'm a dog. It doesn't mean that we have to. I'm, yeah, you know, I'm I'm from I, LA. I, it doesn't mean I walk yeah, around looking again, for people. You from see, LA. you you're talking about things that we discussed about letting them be a leash mm -hmm. so then they not so stressed oh my gosh i should get to that tree same with dogs 
yeah. if we have a dog who is elated from dogs and do not experience in experiencing communication with other dogs the way it should be i mean of leash yeah. that yeah we can have problems with many dogs yeah potentially and, and that's like you said you have to know your dog like i have three di- I, just personally i mean you know clients everybody's different but i'll just share my experience I mm-hmm. have I have three dogs, and each one of those is different about meeting dogs on leash. So I'm not mm-hmm. saying you should meet dogs off leash. I'm not saying it's it's just knowing what you have. I have one dog who absolutely is fine meeting any dog on leash. Right? Mm-hmm. She's going to not create problems. She's not going to get stimulated. She's going to defend herself if she needs to. Like, hey, back off, right? Or mm-hmm. she's going to get curious. Fine. I have another one that's like a rocket. If you tried to make her meet dogs on leash, she's just like. Oh, I got like she needs to move so she does better with space unless she's met the dog already because then that initial explosion is not there. Then I have another one that he's fine meeting, mo- you know, dogs on leash unless they're like the <laughs> or, a, it, or a puppy that's not um, respectful, then he's absolutely going to do something to create discipline, which is what he should do. But I'm not going to let some stranger's dog have that happen to him. I mean, I'm going to be like, yeah, good job, dude, right? Because you're doing that dog a favor. So you just have to know. So if I'm meeting somebody, if I was meeting you with Camilla in the park for the first time with one of my dogs, I would absolutely, as we got closer, drop the leash with one of my dogs because I know that that's a better way for her to succeed. With the other dogs, it's not going to be a big deal. It's annoying because we're like twirling around and trying to get the leashes, and that's how a lot of problems get started. So, I mean, I'm, you know, it's, it's, um, I think, I think sometimes people get fixated on like, you know, the meeting on leash, meeting, like it's meeting off, le- meeting on leash robs dogs the natural communication that they would go through the yin yang right because then we have to spin the stop sometimes they get you know, and we get, and we bring pressure like dogs in the center and here we are going towards yeah yeah so for me i i, I usually i i usually 99 percent of the time don't have my dogs meet dogs on leash i just walk by but i also don't have dogs that are craving dog social skills Right, they go to the dog park, they go to the dog beach, they go to my friends' houses that have dogs. So it's that balance, you know, and it it, it comes down to again understanding, you know, where you are. Um, somebody said M- my dog thinks most dogs behave weird. <laughs> All right, Artem, it's that time. Artem's final thoughts. Do you want to sum it up for us, or do you feel like we did a pretty good job? No, I have some ideas. Go. If we're trying to uh, dig deeper in which conditions our dog lives with us, we will find that almost everything that we provide to them is unnatural for them. So, and if you want to see normal, natural behavior, we should understand how, uh, which conditions should be created by us for the dogs to to make them, how to say, experience that, have that knowledge, to, to, to gain that knowledge by experiencing seeing things the way they should, not the way we want. Mm-hmm. Everything, literally everything is restricting. Living in a yard, restriction. Living in a flat, restriction. Living in a house, being in a house, flat, yard, when we are uh, on work, restriction. So everything, uh, they can, I, I, I said that before in previous episode, they, they cannot even pee and poop Yeah. when they want. <laughs> it's happening like that uh, for, for homeless dogs. Yeah. They just, oh, I need to do this. <laughs> oh, I'm smelling this. I need to leave a mark there. Yeah. yeah. So... We need to understand how to create that conditions where they uh, will be able to feel okay, as you explained, about your trailer, your car, mm-hmm. things like that. Yeah. And I also want to add, uh, ha- had that thought, uh, when we've been talking, uh, how to say it? 
when I gave some tips how to work dog off leash, uh, there is big piece missing. So if dog running away from you, you uh, chasing that dog, getting that leash and start walking with the leash. It's it's uh, a lot of ways how you can do it, but that one uh, works in many situations for many dogs, and it's easy to do that without any uh, kind of uh, not understanding it right. So you running uh, and grabbing that leash and start walking with that leash again, and uh, watching your dog to and you want what you want to see that dog again mentally with you, and then you again dropping leash and letting him run away, do stupid things again, and then you uh, chasing him again, grab that leash, walking with that leash, and then dropping it again when you see dog mentally turn back to you. So those repetitions will, uh, from my experience at least, uh, will show your dog that I get you, no matter you go, no matter where you go, no matter what you do, and I give, I will give you that freedom back so this piece I wanted to add yeah. to that exercise of leash. And you know what I'm going to do too is I'm going to, um, if, you, uh, follow, if you go to the dog side and you sign up for my newsletter, I always add some links and some different things that we um, use to get the episodes, articles and things. One of the things I'll mm -hmm. add is the brand and video that he uses when he's um, working that pit bull, when he's working on claiming space. And he walks and he stops and he backs off and you see the dog respond. Do you remember that mm -hmm. video when you, the, dog's, mm -hmm. the dog's back tied? So he's teaching the dog how to analyze something that's not safe because mm -hmm. he yeah, yeah, yeah. is the one that says it's not safe. And he's doing it on a long line and you can see that that's part of what we need to understand. So I'll, if, you, um, yeah, if you go to the dog side, you, I'll share that. I just found it right now. Uh, and actually, uh, we can add another video, uh, Dog Park, a oh. lot of information. For those one who want to dig deeper, yeah. he explaining so many things and oh, showing yeah. Yeah. so simple things that easy to, uh, how to say, Digest. take, take yeah. it, yeah? Yeah, for and sure. To put them in work, in yeah. situation. Wonderful. Anything else, my friend? No. All right. Beautiful. Thank you for your time. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining us and yeah. being with us, asking questions. We enjoy it tremendously. Yeah. Thank you so much, Artem. I'll catch up with you soon, my friend. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye.